Uh, um, members, we have we have a quorum. Wait a minute. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the um, the minutes of March 12th? Representative Lesh moves that. Are there any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. That motion prevails. Okay. So uh, we have uh, four bills on the agenda today. And um, so House file, <coughs> excuse me, 1126, Representative Winkler is first. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, House file 1126. Yes, uh, wait, wait one second. Winter, so, um, President Winkler, this could have a, uh, we've requested a fiscal note on it, so I'm just wondering, uh, you know, we couple what, there's, okay. So the motion will be that House File um, uh, 1126 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the Public Safety Omnibus Finance Bill. Mr. Chair, that was my understanding. Okay, very good. And I'm sure it will be included, Mr. Chair, because it's really good. <laughs> Please go ahead. <laughs> Members, Mr. Chair, uh, House File 1126 really does two things. It defines position of authority as it applies to a large group of people who work with teens by extending it to a time frame of 24 months beyond the end of the position of authority relationship. And it adds to the list of professionals who uh, cannot initiate any kind of sexual relationship with teens because of their relationship to them through uh, the schools, teachers, coaches, staff, or volunteers. So essentially, members, this says that uh, somebody who works at a school may not engage in sexual contact with a teen um, for a period of 24 months after they've had that position of authority with them. And it extends that list of, of people who may not do this to basically anyone who works in the school building. And I have a couple of testifiers here who can uh, lay out some more of the uh, details for you. Very good. Who wants to go first? I will. My name is Stacy St. George. I'm an assistant Isani County attorney. And I'm also the chair of the Access to Justice Committee um, with Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. I'll be speaking briefly, and then Ms. Dunn will also be speaking after myself. I'm here to speak on behalf of the position of authority change. Clearly, we uh, this is a law that, about protecting children. We live in a state that already has um, a position of authority piece to our law. This is to help cover the loophole. We ask our children to recognize authority at a very young age. We tell them to listen to their teachers, to don't back talk, to not question things. We ask them to have blind faith in that authority, and that's necessary. Because of this blind faith, children who um, follow this authority are often uh, uh, subject to perpetrators. This is a perfect place for a perpetrator to exist. One does not need to look very far to hear numerous cases in the media uh, regarding police officers, teachers, coaches, mentors, Boy Scout leaders, all perpetrated on our youth. We all agree that, that these acts are not only abhorrent, but they're criminal. The question today is not whether or not a school official who's acting in that authority at the time of the sexual act should or should not have sex with children. Clearly, the answer to that is it's criminal and they shouldn't. The question today is really how far before, excuse me, how far after being in that actual position, being the teacher, should we reach out? Imagine, if you will, a 16-year-old child. She has a horrible home life. There's no dad in the picture. Mother is strung out on drugs. But despite all of this, and we can all identify these children in our communities, Despite this, she goes to school, and she goes to school every day, and she does a fairly good job, but she's struggling, and she's struggling in math. So the, teach, so the school being what they uh, so the school, knowing that she needs some help, gets a math teacher and a math tutor. He's a contractor. He's 40 years old. She's 16 years old. During the time in which he's assisting her, he makes her feel confident. He makes her feel good. He makes her feel beautiful. 
He does nothing inappropriate against the law when he puts his hand on the small of her back as he guides her in and out of the room, as he gives hugs that linger a little bit longer. What I'm describing to you, ladies and gentlemen, is what's called grooming. What we find in these cases, as a prosecutor for almost nine years now, and I prosecute solely violent crimes, what I'm finding is these perpetrators are so intelligent and so good at their job that what they do is they groom that child while they are in the position of authority and then wait until after the school year is over. In this particular case, this tutor no longer is her tutor. The contract is over, but he starts to drive her home. Because what perpetrators do is they groom the community, they groom the parents, they groom the children. And so it is until after this, the, um, the actual time in which he's a tutor that he begins the sex acts. And many people are, are surprised to learn that because she's 16 years old, that's no longer a crime the way our law is written today. Because of the bill introduced, it would be a crime. And I ask that you support that, that law. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there qu any questions of the um, Assistant County Attorney? Uh, Mr. Chair. Representative Lesh? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. St. George, which, which county do you prosecute in? Isanti. So Isanti County, which, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, is Lesh. Cambridge in uh, Isanti County? Ms. St. George. Okay, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so I, I lived in Cambridge a little bit. I was less than one year old, but I'm not really a native, but maybe for like six months. <laughs> but <clears throat> my question is for you, Ms. St. George, um, say this happened in Cambridge, a smaller town. I'm not sure what the population is, but I'm guessing it's south of 20,000. Um, and they, the concern is, is not with the 40-year-old the creeper um, as it is with the 18-year-old kid uh, who manages the Dairy Queen in in Cambridge um, and a 16 year old girl uh, gets a job there uh, cooking onion rings <clears throat> uh, for a period in the spring that doesn't work out but um, she leaves after a week um, less than two years later maybe a year and a half they start dating at the high school um, now, at the time, she never worked for him as a supervisor, but he was technically a supervisor at the Dairy Queen at the time. They become boyfriend-girlfriend. They have sex, boom, he's a sex offender. He has to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life. Um, how do you square that, and is that a, is that a just result? Ms. St. George. Thank you. I, if, if I understand your scenario, he's 18 at the time that he's her supervisor, and and then is in school past his 18th birthday? I, I apologize for not understanding your scenario. Representative Lesh, you want to restate your facts? Uh, Mr. Chair and Ms. St. George, um, no, maybe you can uh, uh, tell me if this only matters of whether he's in school. I'm talking about whether he's a manager at the Dairy Queen at the time. Um, and she works for, she works there, because the, the, the line I'm concerned about is line 1.12, no matter how brief. So she works there for a brief period of time. There's not adequate amount of time to groom anyone. If, and it's presumably, if he's an 18-year-old kid and she's 16, it's one of those things where we wouldn't presume that, that there's a grooming activity going on. Maybe there is. Who knows? But normally, um, this bill is stated to, to close a loophole. Is this the loophole we're really trying to close here? And would it have an unjust result? On, on the 18-year-old and the 16-year-old. Ms. Van George. Thank you, sir. And I understand your question, and I think it's a legitimate one. I think, and, and I apologize for my question back to you. It was more so I wanted to make sure we were talking at which line we were talking about. Because when we're talking about someone being a school teacher, that's a different paren than the scenario that you're giving. So I apologize if I didn't understand your original question. I do think that that is a concern. One of the conversations we had in our committee um, is ensuring that we are using this law to show when, pe when there is a grooming process. Case law has, um, has helped develop that um, idea that we need to be able to tie the grooming, tie the relationship. For example, when we added in paren P, we talked about because the actor's employment volunteer contractual status, the actor has access to the complainant. I think that can be the same 
um, issue that you are addressing if we add that language. Ms. St. George, so the, uh, line 614.614, .614, is that, you know, I, I never know exactly how to slice and dice the years here, but uh, Representative Lesh maybe is that, <clears throat> that that would be that the um, actor is four years older than the um, than the victim, if I understand. Does Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, and yes, I, I sometimes uh, have trouble slicing and dicing this as well. So the four years um, may be where I got into trouble on that, but say, say the age is 20 and 16. Now, and the reason I ask this, members, is everyone on this committee probably has a slightly, it's probably not that far apart, but a slightly different age at which some things should be construed in the, in the common vernacular of statutory rape. Someone would say 20 and 16. They'd be like, well, you know, I grew up in a small town. Sometimes that kind of thing happens. And then someone would say 20 and, and 16. And another person on this committee would say, absolutely not. Are you kidding me? That's disgusting. That's inappropriate. So we're forced in this committee to have to come to, to a conclusion about where this is. And the breakdown over the historical <laughs> common decision by the legislature is this list here, and as well as in, in the list for, for second degree, um, which you're familiar with because you prosecute. My, my concern is by expanding that list um, with the language that's, that's added, um, extending it out to two years, especially when the time period is no matter how brief, I think that's a larger opening um, or a tighter close of the loophole than maybe some members of this committee would be comfortable with. And that's why I asked the question. <laughs> oh. Who wants to field that, Representative Winkler? Mr. Chair, Representative Lesh, I guess I can address one narrow part of your question, which is the addition or the further clarification of people who uh, would be included in this list. So 6.7 down through 6.14, we're only talking, your scenario would not apply as a result of this language because the person that you're describing is not an employee, contractor, or a volunteer at the school. And they are not getting access to this individual because of their employment status or volunteer status or contract status at the school. And so the key line is 6.13, which is the and. It has to be all of these things that cause the uh, perpetrator to have access to the student. So the, uh, your, your Dairy Queen scenario, it, it may be, um, I'm not sure how that's changed by the rest of the bill. Okay. I think I, I think Representative I, Lash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, so in reality, my concerns would only apply um, if this uh, older student was only a school employee and say they were um, an assistant coach on the, on the girls' volleyball team or something. Mr. Chair, that's correct. Okay. All right, thank you. I may think of some other questions, but for now those those concerns are alleviated. Okay, let's hear from your other tip. Oh, 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 sorry, Representative Neuberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to echo uh, just one little more clarification, building off what uh, Representative Lesh was talking about. Um, I have, a, I have a, a daughter who's in high school, and she, uh, she's a teacher's aide for one of the teachers. Uh, she's clearly in a position of some authority, as some kids would see. Uh, she carries out functions that, are, uh, that helps, helps this teacher. Uh, the teacher's aide program is fairly common. So if, if we have a student who's in a perceived position of authority, such as a teacher's aide, who is uh, 18 or 17, uh, and following Representative Lesh's um, algorithm here, uh, we have the same type of situation where you have uh, two students uh, mm -hmm. shortly thereafter start dating and then have a physical relationship. Uh, it goes south. One of them gets mad at the other. Uh, now, do now does this law apply to that to that student? Is because it would be in a perceived position of authority. Miss St. George. No, it does not. And here is why. If you look at 6.11, and I'm not sure the ages that you're referring to, but I'm going to assume that you're referring to a, a separation of more than 48 months. Um, if you say because of the actor's employment volunteer contractual status, the actor has access to the complainant. In your scenario, 
whether, and I won't use your daughter as the example, but a person who is in an aid position um, has access to fellow school mates because they're going to that school. Now, a situation in which we know that juvenile, uh, we have juvenile offenders, clearly. They groom children, they groom other children just the same as adults do. If I, as a prosecutor, see the grooming process because that person has access to that child solely through that aid program, they wouldn't associate in any other way. They're not in the same class. Perhaps they're being an aid, for example, and, and um, perhaps um, those who are in a smaller town understand that we have sometimes K through 12 programs. If the set, if the 17-year-old is an aide to six-year-olds or is an aide to you know, much younger kids, that would be more of the scenario that we would be looking at because of um, 6.11 through, well, actually all the way through the end. Representative Newberger, maybe we could ask, ask staff if I could ask uh, uh, Mr. Diebel to sort of explain the, a couple of, maybe this will help if he could explain it. It sounds like there are two different provisions that we're talking about here on page one, the current or recent position of authority, and then on page um, two also, but then on page six deals more with, um, with schools and uh, other contractual service providers. So if you could just maybe just explain this a little bit, what the current law is, Mr. Diebel, and what the bill, and what, and what changes are being made. Excuse me. Yes, Mr. Chair. So the bill seeks to do two things. Uh, the first is to extend the range of the position of authority from the current time period to two years beyond the period when the person no longer is in a position of authority. And so Representative Lesh's example of a Dairy Queen manager over a teenager between the age of 16 up to 18 would apply so long as the person in a position of authority was four years older than the victim. The second uh, objective of the bill is for in schools where the person isn't technically in a position of authority over the person but gains access to the person, the child, then that person would be subject to uh, third or fourth degree crim sex conduct charges if they have sexual relationship with the child after the relationship um, ended up to two years. So they both extend the scope of the criminal penalties for two years beyond the uh, period when their formal relationship ends, but they do seek to do two different things. And one is limited to the school setting, the other applies to any scenario where the adult is in a position of authority over the uh, child. Okay. Is that, uh, is that uh, helpful? Yes, sure. I'll go back to you, Representative Newberger, in a second. Representative Lesh. Oh, uh, thank you. So uh, if I can then, Mr. Diva, what is the, what is the uh, most closest example of ages where we could get a, uh, a felony violation of CSC on this then? Um, how close in age could they be? Mr. Diebel. Mr. Chair, Representative Lesh, I'll defer to the prosecutor, but I would imagine that someone up until the day before they turn 18 be the victim, and then someone that was, um, would be then just uh, four years older than that or beyond that would be, could be in a position of authority over that person. Once the person be child becomes 18, then this position of authority no longer applies. Okay, well, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Diebel, that was not the case before, pr prior in, in Minnesota law. It was not, um, I mean, age, okay, I think, I think I understand this now. So age of authority applies um, in, in, the, in the case of this, which what we commonly refer to as statutory rape, it only applied to up to 16. In the case of position of authority, it, applied all the way up to 17 years old and 364 days. So you could have a seven, almost 18-year-old child, and you could have a almost 23-year-old uh, child, almost 24-year-old child, 
No, well, I can't even do math anymore. If I could have done math, I would have gone to medical school, but here I am at the legislature. Whatever the case, four years, and then we would have a felony violation. Is that right? Mr. Thiebaud. Mr. Chair and members, that's my understanding. I, I stand to be corrected, but. I believe it's 48 months. M Ms. 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 Uh, St. George. Thank you. I believe it's 48 months difference. Okay. Okay, let's just go through the chair so we have this on tape. What's going on? Did Understood. You have question? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I'll, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll think about that. I, uh, I just, uh, I guess I have the same reservations I did before, but I'll let other members of the committee speak. Representative Brugger, did you have further comments? Okay, Representative Cornish. Oh, Mr. Chair, and uh, to the testifier, or Representative Winkler, the one concern I had was right now we have some county attorneys that seem like they're hesitant to charge. We had a case where um, there was a coach involved with a student, and the uh, the defense put up an argument because this happened, I believe, during the three months vacation. There was no position of authority anymore, and the uh, it obviously had some effect in the prosecution because they they plea bargained it down. And I'm just wondering what the prosecutor think if Mr. Kingry could come up and give a comment about uh, the willingness to, for them to prosecute something that's uh, with a vague uh, definition of recent or current or recent. I just wonder if if okay. anything came from the prosecutor's request or if they've endorsed this fully or. Can you make room for uh, Mr. Kingry to testify? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kingry, welcome to the committee. <clears throat> Mr. Members, member, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it's been a long uh, week for all of us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is John Kingree on behalf of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. Mincasa did share a draft of this bill with us last year, uh, and we did uh, endorse the draft at that time. Um, however, um, we did have concerns over the, the length of time with regard to two years. We didn't come up with an alternative but we thought two years was a little, um, a little long. With regards to the particular case that I believe you're talking about, Representative Cornish, um, I don't want to pretend to know what went into those decisions, um, but as you know, the uh, case was eventually, um, or you may know, the case was eventually dismissed um, in uh, Blue Earth County. Mm -hmm. Representative Cornish. That's it. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, can we hear maybe from uh, Ms. Dunn now and then... Uh, open it back up for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Representative Winkler, thank you, and committee members. My name is Donna Dunn. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and I'm here to speak in support of this <coughs> proposal. Um, we are um, a membership organization, <coughs> excuse me, representing over 70 sexual assault centers uh, and advocacy programs in Minnesota, and we are working to create a balanced uh, response to sexual violence in Minnesota, which combines both an effective response to victim survivors in crisis, um, a responsive justice system, and primary prevention of sexual violence. We see that this bill is one way that for us to um, respond to and establish uh, cultural understandings and standards that can help protect children um, and help prevent the lifetime of harm that is done when a young person um, and particularly in sexually formative years, uh, finds themselves sexually assaulted, coerced, or manipulated by a person who's been in a position of authority, and this is a person that they that should be in, engaged in that child's protection, um, that child's nurturing and guidance. Um, and we are aware of cases such as Representative Cornish just mentioned, where um, the position, actual position of authority has ended, um, and maybe um, a week, a month later, um, the defense might be, um, but uh, this is the position of authority no longer exists when, in fact, perhaps the tales of that relationship are still um, uh, powerful for the child. So I'm here to urge you to support this. Um, we would like to see this enacted. Um, we know that there is confusion right now um, in the interpretation about when, uh, how the position of authority affects once that actual relationship has ended when in fact the um, pressure may still exist. Um, I'd like to um, uh, offer that I, I know we've had discussion about the two-year time limit. Um, I believe Ms. St. George can respond to that, um, um, but um, we don't think that that is in fact too long a time. Thank you very much. 
Thank you for your testimony. Questions? Representative Lash. Thank you. Ms. Dunn, um, would you, uh, so the, the prosecutions that uh, Ms. St. George is saddled with, there's many of them there's no question about. The 40-year-old creeper who's, uh, who's hanging around, who absolutely should know better, um, is different from uh, the young high school boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, one of whom gets uh, saddled with a lifelong of registering as a sex offender. Is there any room to talk about uh, extending the uh, age or, or toying with the, uh, not just the limit uh, for the two years, um, but also if you are going to expand the statute in this way um, so as not to ensnare um, innocent, otherwise innocent young people? Ms. Dunn. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Lesh, um, um, I, I'm glad to use the word toy with. I know that these limits are in fact, you know, seem to be fairly arbitrary because at some point a person might be a day away from being out of that, that limit. So I know that there is some arbitrariness or there is some challenge when we set a limit that, that um, um, goes to a particular day uh, in the life of, of a person. So um, it, it seems to me that that would have larger impact on the position of authority overall, not only the extension of the, the coverage of this. So I'm, I don't think that I'm a, the best person to respond to that. Okay. Well, Mr. Chair, as, absolutely, and, and I understand that you need a flow chart to follow this now. Mm -hmm. And we're all sitting around the committee, and if you asked any one individual, there might be very few that could rattle off um, what's legal and what's not, depending on how old you are and what you do. And that's, that's always very dangerous when we as a legislature set those policies. We need a flow chart to determine what, the, what, what is right and what is wrong in any given state. That said, by being too bright line, you absolutely are going to ensnare uh, more people. So this, this graduated uh, type of statutory scheme, I think, results in uh, more justice than less. Uh, however, to the extent that we're expanding it, I guess I personally, to support it, would like to see um, some, uh, some allotment for the other side where we're not ensnaring those individuals that most of us around the table would agree should not be ensnared. Representative Johnson. Mr. Chair, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Ms. St. George for, com for coming here today. I've worked with her on numerous cases, and I want to thank her for getting the last uh, crim sex case I had settled without having to, you to leave here to go to court. Um, quest question I have is we've had a few of these situations in Isani County, uh, one involving a youth leader not in a school setting. Would this bill also encompass that situation? Yes. Miss Ms. St. George. Yes, sir, it would. Thank you. Rep Representative uh, Ugham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess I'll be brief, but I, I think Representative Lish is right on uh, as far as this goes with the ensnarement and possible problems with, uh, with younger kids. Uh, I think the rest of the bill is, is, is very good, but we have to look at this, uh, those time frames, I, I think, are much too tight for, for some of these, uh, <coughs> the younger kids that could be involved with this. Ms. Representative Winkler. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm certainly open to that conversation. I'm not really sure how this bill changes the complication or makes that more complicated than it is already. It extends it to school employees, volunteers, coaches, uh, people like that, um, and it, ex it extends the time frame for position of authority, but it doesn't change the 48-month period. It doesn't change any of those things. Um, and, you know, there's always the really simple test, which is, you know, if you're going to err, err on the safe side, you know, when it comes to sexual contact with teenagers. Mr. Chair. Representative Lesh. Absolutely, Representative Winkler. But at a certain point, we're dealing with all kinds of collateral consequences around here now. I mean, th this committee has to deal with collateral consequences all the time. I do expungement hearings in Ramsey County, and I have a number of people come up to me. And, you know, just because you're a young kid 
um, and you had a, a, a CSC, you have a, you have a rape charge, and it was one of those technically statutory rapes, as you would call it, which is not the words we use for it in Minnesota, but that's what most people understand. So that's the term I use. And, and I don't presume necessarily that it's completely innocent. I mean, you, in, in some of those charges, absolutely the, uh, the charge should fit. But in some of them, when I have people coming back to me uh, 10 years later or, or or even less than 10 years later who say, you know, I, I can't get a job, I can't get an apartment, I'm married uh, to her. Uh, we were boyfriend and girlfriend at the time, but her dad didn't like me, um, and the county attorney charged it. Yes, you err on the side of safety, but then inevitably we have to deal with the uh, fallout of that in this committee later on too. So that's why I think maybe it, those 48-month those limits uh, do stand um, some some scrutiny if we were going to expand it to say two years out from any period of authority, however temporary. That's why I brought it up. Do you want to say anything else? Well, Mr. Chair, I, I don't have any concerns about looking at this issue more broadly. I'm just not sure how this bill uh, raises that issue particularly. And, you know, uh, you know, Representative Lesh, I know you care very much about this, but members, the statistics are fairly startling. We're talking about one in 19 girls in this age group being sexually assaulted. I mean, this is a pretty real problem. So, um, and I'm not suggesting that anybody is not concerned about that, but we have to remember that we have these laws in place the way they are for a good reason, too. Okay, so um, I, I guess, Representative Winkler, there's still some room to, to work on this at some point if we pass this on and um, I mean, if we, yeah, because we're going to be laying the bill over. So, um, you know, I think that you've heard some concerns about overreach here and, and what, what the bill may or may not do. So uh, with that, do you have anything else you want to say? Mr. Chair, I guess I'd just like to, the final point I would make is that one of the most important parts about this is clarifying the relationship in schools and with coaches because there is a great deal of uncertainty about that in Minnesota law right now and we do need to clarify that. I think the discussion about 24 months uh, is, the, is, the play, is the conversation we can have. Right, exactly. I think your bill does that. So, okay, are there any further discussion? So uh, the chair will lay over House File um, 1126 for possible inclusion in the Omnibus Public Safety Finance Bill. Thank you, Representative Winkler you, and your testifiers. Okay, um, Representative Simonson, House File 1010. Uh, Representative Simonson, welcome to your committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I would like to move House File 1010 to recommend approval and lay over for possible inclusion in your omnibus finance bill. Very good. Uh, members, can you please turn your cell phones off and uh, Representative Simonson explain your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill, uh, House File 1010 members, is the fix that we need to correct an unintended change in the law. Um, I'll just give you some quick background. In 2005, the legislature enacted a bill to create life sentences for some sex offenders and to recodify the existing sentencing enhancement statutes for sex offenders. One of the primary goals at that time was to increase public safety by imposing harsher sentences on repeat sex offenders. To achieve this, the bill at that time increased the sentencing guideline weights assigned to the most serious prior first and second degree offenses. It also assigned offenders an additional custody status point if they committed an offense while on probation or supervised release for a previous criminal sexual conduct offense. It was known at the time that some repeat offenders could fall into the area of uh, the sentencing guideline grid where offenders are recommended probation if they are no longer under supervision and if their prior offense was not one of the more serious offenses which received the added sentencing weights enacted by the 2005 law. However, at that time, a mandatory minimum for repeat offenders was in. It was always intended that repeat offenders would have presumptive prison dispositions, either because of where they fell on the new grid or because of the mandatory minimum provision for subsequent offenders. 
It came to attention in 2007 that the 36-month presumptive sentencing provision had been repealed, apparently as part of an error when moving the bill through the legislature in 2005. Not only has this resulted in some repeat offenders not being subjected to mandatory sentencing, but it has also weakened prosecutors' ability to achieve reasonable plea agreements. Since 2008, Mincasa has made repeated requests to the legislature to reinstate presumptive sentencing. A fiscal note prepared in 2011 projected that reinstating 36-month presumptive sentencing would have no fiscal impact in the first two years after reenactment and a projected fiscal impact of 19,000 and 58,000 in the third and fourth years after reenactment growing to 84,000 in the fifth year. This projected fiscal impact has been a barrier to reestablishing 36 month presumptive sentencing. Uh, just to update the committee, uh, uh, an updated fiscal note has been requested. And members, this bill would assure that all repeat criminal sexual conduct offenders, including those whose repeat offenses include third or fourth degree criminal sexual conduct offenses would be subject to a presumptive minimum 36 month sentence as was the case prior to 2005. This bill has the support of Mincasa as well as the Minnesota Association of County Attorneys and I would turn it over to the testifiers. Thank you Representative Simonson. Who wants to start? Ms. Dow? Um, thank you um, Chair Paymar, Representative Simonson and committee members. Um, as I said quite recently, my name is Donna Dunn. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And I just would briefly like to say that um, the, the fact that this uh, oversight happened came to our attention uh, early in 2007 when prosecutors, we, we work with a group of prosecutors called the Access to Justice Committee. Um, and our role with them is to help understand where, um, what kinds of resources they, we can help them access in order to um, make their jobs easier and one of the things we heard from this group of prosecutors was what happened to this I used to have this tool available um, it has gone away and when that was um, researched further it was determined that it had gone away inadvertently it wasn't the intention at the time so we have had a commitment to um, bring this issue back every time we have brought it to this committee and to other committees it has been supported entirely um, what has been in the way is the fiscal note um, I would just like to say again, we would like to encourage the passage of this to give um, our criminal justice um, colleagues another tool to use, particularly what's of interest to us is that this is a group of people who are apparently offending um, in third or fourth degree level criminal sexual conduct. So it's a lower level. And if we have an ability to have um, to intervene when somebody is repeating offenses at a lower level, may that not, um, in fact, save us from dealing with somebody who is perpetrating crimes at a, at a much higher level of violence. Um, so we um, encourage support uh, for this. At the time that this was left out of the sentencing guidelines, um, it would have made sense that the bed, that the fiscal note, that the money be reclaimed from the Department of Corrections because they no longer that no longer would have applied to them. That, however, did not happen. Um, and uh, so it was absorbed in DOC's budget. So again, we're asking for your consideration in supporting this uh, proposal. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions of Ms. Dunn? Okay, then, uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Kelly Mitchell. I'm Executive Director of the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. And I'm here to let you know that the Commission does support um, this bill. This bill, the, the repeal of the 36 month mandatory minimum occurred almost simultaneously with the creation and enactment of the sex offender grid in 2006. When the grid was enacted, the Commission gave very careful consideration to determining which offenders should be recommended for a probationary sentence and which offenders should be uh, recommended for a, um, a prison sentence. And that was reflected on the grid. Those in the shaded area are probation and those that are in the non-shaded area are, um, are prison. One area that the commission didn't, what, what we built in some additional enhancements as um, Representative Simonson explained just a few moments ago but one area that we didn't specifically enhance on the grid was the shaded area for repeat sex offenders because when the grid was developed, we thought this 36 month mandatory minimum was already in place and it wasn't necessary to build any more enhancements into the grid to take care of repeat offenders. 
but the Commission does believe that it serves public safety to sentence repeat offenders more harshly than first-time offenders. And so for those reasons, we do support this bill. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, then. Uh, Representative, Representative Simonson, do you uh, have anything further to say? Oh, let me ask if there's anyone who is a, a, uh, has opposition to this bill. Oh, okay. Very well. Please state your name for the Chairman record. and committee members, I'm Ryan Else, uh, and I represent the Minnesota Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Um, I would just uh, like to point out that this bill limits judicial discretion in a way that has been counter to many of the legal trends that have been favored by both the United States Supreme Court and the Minnesota Supreme Court um, that recognize the, the necessity of judges to be able to sentence according to the specific parameters of the case that they're dealing with. And by taking those powers away from the judge, it just limits the, the judge's ability to reach the appropriate sentence. Uh, it's also just not necessary for public safety reasons that have been, as was cited earlier, um, there have already been increased mandatory sentences for the worst of the sex offenders. Um, and so the people who would be targeted by this provision would be the le less serious offenders, and um, those are the cases in which I think the judges really do need to be able to exercise additional discretion. Um, oh, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Ryan Else, E-L-S-E. E-L-S-E. Representative Lesh. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, and I'm wondering, in light of Mr. L's testimony, I don't recall hearing when we have people come in and testify um, about modifying, as, as Mr. Ells has stated, restricting the authority of individual judges. Um, I don't recall hearing examples of instances where judges have maybe abused the discretion afforded them under the sentencing guidelines, and is that is that driving this bill? Um, do we have examples? Maybe the author has of judges who have um, who have not well, they, they've abused their discretion, and so we have to we have to restrict their discretion. All all the judges in the state, because a few of them failed to appropriately sentence uh, these repeat offenders. And what were those instances? Do we have those? Maybe um, maybe Ms. Mitchell has examples of that. What, what are the, I think we should know the judges' names. Are you, uh, do you have a question here? I, yes, I'd like to know Mr. the names Chair. of the, Mr. Chair, I'd like to know the names of the judges who, I don't want to use the word abuse of discretion because that may not be the appropriate uh, characterization, but who failed to sentence how we would expect? Which judges were those? And why do we have to change the law because they didn't do that? Ms. Ms. Mitchell, do you want to respond to that? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Lesh. Um, what I can say, I, I don't think I can answer your question directly, but this is what I can say. Prior to the repeal of the law, there was about a 15% departure rate for offenders who would have been subject to the mandatory minimum. And those departures are appropriate because the role of the departure is to take into account circumstances that are atypical. The mandatory minimum and the guidelines uh, are appropriate for the typical case. Departures are appropriate when there's an atypical case. So in that case, I think the judge actually appropriately exercise discretion and determine that prison would not have been the right sentence for the for that 15 percent of offenders. Representative Lesh. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Ms. Mitchell, then, you don't have a departure rate now because it wouldn't be a departure. So do you have commensurate um, metrics suggesting if it's happened differently since we didn't have uh, after after the guidelines are in place? Ms. Mitchell. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Paymar, yes, there, there have been uh, just eight offenders 
since 2006 who fall into this uh, category where their offense occurred more than 15 years ago, or I'm sorry, less than 15 years ago, and they've now committed, committed a new offense, but their criminal history is, is low enough that they don't fall into the shaded portion of the grid. In one of those eight cases, the prosecutor uh, sought an aggravated sentence, and the judge did actually aggravate the sentence and send the offender to prison. So the other seven received probationary sentences instead because that's what was appropriate under the guidelines. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ms. Chair. So, so we, we've gone from 15% to one in eight, and again, I can't do math, so I don't know what that is, but I, I presume that, that that's somewhat of a drop. Do, do we have, of the other uh, seven, do we know who those judges are, and, and has anyone asked them what was their reasons for doing this? Ms. Mitchell, I don't, are, are you asking her to name the judges? Mr. Chair, yes. If, if she has the name. Ms. Mitchell? Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Lesh, I don't have those I don't have those names today, but there's really no issue with the judges have acting have having acted inappropriate. They were following the guidelines. What we're trying to say here is that the guidelines without that mandatory without the mandatory minimum in place are contrary to the intent of the commission. The commission did believe that a, se a prison sentence was appropriate for these offenders because they're repeat offenders. But the but the um, commission has not. Or, but the but with the, with the mandatory minimum repealed, the judge doesn't have a choice other than to sentence the offender to probation because that's where they fall on the grid. And then the prosecutor would be the one to have to pursue an aggravated sentence which as we all know after Blakely is a, a much more rigorous process. Okay, all right, thank you. Other questions? Do, do you have a response to Mr. Elsie's comments or do you want to just, or Representative Simonson, or, or you want to? I can just uh, answer it in my closing comments. Okay, thank you Mr. Elsie for your uh, testimony. Anyone else who wishes to speak in opposition to the bill? Very good, are there any, dis any further discussion or questions? Representative Simonson, you get the last word. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And very briefly, in your packet, members, there should be a letter from the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission. And on the second page or the last page of that letter talks about these nine instances that you just heard described here in response to Representative Lesh's question. So if you have further questions, uh, it's spelled out pretty well in that, in that letter. But um, okay. beyond that, I, I think it's a good bill, and I would encourage your support. Okay, so Representative Simonson uh, renews his motion that... Uh, House file uh, 1010 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus public safety finance bill. All those, uh, Chair will lay that over. So, um, Representative Simonson, why don't you just stay up there and do your other bill as long as we're, you're there. Before he does it, Mr. Chair, can I say something? Yes, Representative Lash. And um, just to clarify, I wanted to wait until I, that, that bill was done, but I think it's absolutely appropriate. Um, during times where we're talking about modifying guidelines, I, I am an advocate for judicial discretion on this committee. And if we're going to restrict judicial discretion, I think it's absolutely appropriate to have conversations about why we're doing it in which instances. Um, I think that Representative Simon and the testifiers adequately explained to me in this committee the reasons for it, and Ms. Mitchell did. Um, but I think we dance around that question far too often. And I think it's important to get uh, specific. So that's all I wanted to say, Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank you. Representative Simonson, you want to present uh, House File, or do you want to move uh, House File 449? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will what is move House File 449 with the recommendation to pass and be re referred to the Committee on Taxes. And I think my subsequent comments will explain why. Well, okay, we'll uh, leave that motion there for now. Why don't you explain your bill? <laughs> and I'm going to apologize ahead of time, Mr. Chair, because we seem to have some confusion on amendments. I think in your packet there should be a A13-0207. Okay, so uh, Representative Simonson moves the uh, 207 amendment to get the bill uh, in the shape that he wants it. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
Okay, Representative Simonson. In addition to that, and this is where my confusion comes in, is I also have an amendment uh, that's not in your packet, um, but I will explain the amendment, and then what I will do is try to include it as we move on to the next committee stop, if that's all right with you, because we're inside the 24 hours. Is it, is it a substantive it's amendment? It's a very it? substantive amendment. <laughs> And, and it will explain why I need this to go. All right, Representative Simonson, go ahead, and then we'll see where we're at. Okay. Um, the bill, members, is essentially, and, and I'm, the, the, the amendment that I wanted to have in front of you is essentially a delete-all amendment that changes the, the revenue source for this reimbursement of sales tax paid to rather than come from the 911 fund to come from the general fund. So you can imagine that's a significant change. And I really, at that point, would even question why it's here in front of you, other than we are going to talk a little bit about armor purchases, which is somewhat relevant. Very good. So as I move forward, it'll be my intent uh, to, to introduce that amendment, and that will alleviate a number of concerns from a number of folks that I've heard from. But to the bill itself, um, the bill will accomplish what I would call fairness uh, in the state with respect to sales tax paid by counties and cities on end user equipment related to armor. And we've heard a number of times uh, this session discussions about armor and we know what that means with the allied radio metric system that, uh, that is now in place across the state. Um, the original bill was drafted to uh, talk about taking these dollars out of the 911 account and since, since that has been done, I've had a number of discussions with a number of interested parties and while there may be dollars in that account right now today, um, I'm convinced that those dollars need to stay there as we move forward to subsequent projects uh, enhancing our 911 system and our, and our radio system. So I don't think that's, that's a good funding source. And quite frankly, if, if I'm going to try to sell you this bill on the concept of fairness, um, I think that it does need to be made up within the general fund. Um, with respect to the fiscal note, which should be in your packet, um, and again, as I move forward to get us in front of the tax committee, um, I, I don't find that this fiscal note is, is really accurate because I, the, as the note explains, it assumes that tax dollars that were paid with grants received by counties uh, would be reimbursed, and that is not my intent uh, of this particular bill. So a number of, of uh, tax dollars were paid with grants across the state, and that's going to reduce the size of that fiscal note. But again, uh, once we get this bill in the shape that we want it, I think that the fiscal note will be significantly less. Uh, but we will work on that before we get to the tax committee. So you're asking me why are we here in front of you? Uh, Minnesota statute currently exempts 25 counties across the state uh, from paying sales tax on these, these uh, end user uh, equipments uh, due to implementation of armor. And the 25 include nine metro counties as well as the southeast corner of the state of Minnesota which leaves 62 counties that are paying and have paid sales tax and uh, in comparison to the 25 that have not, I find that to be unfair. Um, this bill as drafted would be retro to purchases made after January 1st, 2011. And uh, at, that, at this point, I would just like to turn it over to uh, testifier John Ungaro on behalf of St. Louis County. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, for the record, John Ungaro, Government Relations Director for St. Louis County. Representative Simonson asked me to just say a few words here today about the property tax implications that Armour has had on counties, as well as uh, you know the on-again and off-again situation when it comes to the sales tax exemption on equipment for Armour. Uh, overall, in the state, uh, since the implementation of Armour, close to $100 million in local levy uh, has been raised by counties to pay for our portion of, of the armor system. And to put that into perspective for my county, uh, that translates into about $8 million, uh, which coincidentally is about an 8% increase in our, in our levy. Now, obviously, we didn't pay for that all in one year, but it gives you an idea of how uh, significant this dollar amount can be for uh, local county uh, budgets. Um, as far as the um, sales tax exemption issue, I can honestly say that uh, that it was a nice carrot that the state had to offer 
and that first wave of counties of 25 counties, I think you know that helped convince them to go to Armour. And quite honestly, for most of that next wave of, of counties, uh, likewise, they thought that they were going to be able to achieve that same sales tax exemption. And I can really say that it was a deciding factor for for several counties to to go forward with Armour rather rather than the least expensive but lower quality uh, VHF uh, narrowband uh, option. So um, I guess I, I have to echo what Rec Representative Simonson said about the um, fairness and equity that uh, needs to be uh, implemented so that those remaining counties have the same treatment that the initial wave of counties received when it comes to the sales tax exemption and I agree with him that I think the overall fiscal note uh, can be reduced because uh, we're probably double counting some of the grants that that counties received as part of building their their armor systems and obviously we don't endorse getting a sales tax exemption on and grant money so we're uh, we're optimistic that 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 overall fiscal note will keep going down somewhat Thank you, Mr. Engel. Uh, any uh, questions of the testifier? Representative Cornish. Uh, Angoro, I should Mr. say. Mr. Is it Angoro? I'm sorry. Angoro? Angaro. Angaro. It's, it's actually a view. I just was wondering about the, uh, the oral amendments, kind of substantive amendment. And I would rather have it done somewhere else in this committee with this shorter notice. I mean, switching the funding if that was planned. But I support the bill because one of my counties is involved. But just. I, I think that we were. Go I was asking Representative Simonson if he would, if this is okay. I mean, I, I get uh, that we would, uh, that the motion would be to pass it without recommendation to the committee on taxes, and that's when the substantive amendment would no. be offered. And if we can find millions of dollars in the general fund to do this, <laughs> do that. Okay. Is that okay. I mean, if it's not, we will. We can just lay it on the table lay it on the table, I guess, and take it up. Mr. Chair, maybe before we move forward, it, the cleanest way to do this would be to withdraw my original motion and uh, make a motion to have this committee, uh, without recommendation, refer to taxes. Well, I'm fine with a recommendation, but or to pass, I mean. As a member of the tax committee, I think it was probably a good, I think it's probably a good substitute motion. Okay. So, uh, any questions? Any other questions? Representative Simonson, anything else? You want to renew your motion then? I will I'll renew my motion that House File 449 uh, be re referred to taxes without recommendation. Be, be passed. Be passed as amended. Passed with, as amended. Without recommendation and referred to the Committee on Taxes. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Prevails. Thank you, Representative Thank Simons. You. Okay. How about some info? Ooh, this seat is warm. Chair, uh, I'd like to move Reps to, uh, House File 1400, 1400 uh, to pass and be referred to the General Register, and I have a small uh, oral amendment. Okay, what is the oral amendment? The oral amendment Mr. is Paymer. on line 7.18, uh, strike the word uh, abuse and insert the word conduct. The amendment is on line 7.18, the first word of the line, abuse, strike the word abuse and insert conduct. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion passes. Thank you, Representative Paymar, to your bill as amended. Mr. Chair, members, this uh, bill does four uh, slight things to uh, um, our statute on violating uh, uh, protection orders. Um, on page two of the bill, it uh, strikes the word knowingly. Uh, if you violate an order for protection, you violate the 
order and we're, we're deleting the word knowingly from statute. Uh, given the, uh, and the second thing it does, given the technological changes uh, over the years, on page four of the bill, we have some language about venue, which so would, which would include uh, um, violations of an order for protection, not just coming from a landline telephone, but also would include, uh, include cell phones for violations of a Danko or an order for protection. Uh, the final, the, on page five of the bill, it uh, has a language that includes, um, where's the family? removes the language family or household members, uh, allowing the enhancement of a violation of a, a no contact order. And uh, it also clarifies the violations of protective orders qualify as conduct to be used when prosecuting domestic assault cases. With me is um, um, Mr. Pinto from the county, attorney, county attorney's office uh, and Ms. Richards from the Minnesota Coalition for Battered Women. So if I could turn it over to Mr. Pinto for... Thank you, Mr. Pinto. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, Dave Pinto, P-I-N-T-O, Assistant Ramsey County Attorney. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, which has endorsed House File 1400. I want to thank the Chair and members, and of course, especially uh, Representative Paymar, uh, our sponsor of the bill, for their leadership on domestic violence issues. Um, this is a... House File 1400 is a set of four, um, as Representative Paymar described them, um, uh, updates or fixes, um, some cleanup to domestic violence statutes. Um, you sh members should have a sheet prepared by Minnesota Coalition for Battered Women that has some information about the changes. I'll quickly walk through the four of them. Um, first change is in Bill Sections 1, 4, and 5 relating to violations of protective orders. Um, First, the structure of domestic violence statutes, including for protective orders, is such uh, that a defendant who violates a protective order or has a domestic assault will receive a misdemeanor unless the defendant has a certain prior record. Um, one prior uh, qualified domestic type offense in the prior 10 years gives the defendant a gross misdemeanor, and two priors in the past 10 years gives the defendant a felony. That's the basic structure. Well, in the uh, protective order statutes, um, the violations of protective order requires that the state prove that the defendant knew of the existence of the order. That's the basic requirement. Well, in the statute currently, there's an additional word, this word of knowingly violated the order, only for gross misdemeanor and felony violations of those orders. Um, one might think that that word knowingly violated is the same as knowing the existence of the order, but in a couple of appellate decisions last year that, that actually overturned convictions, the uh, appellate court said no, that word knowingly means that the state has to prove both that the defendant knew of the order and knowingly violated the order, sort of adding this additional level. Um, this is, of course, a higher mental standard then for those gross misdemeanor and felony level crimes as opposed to the misdemeanor level. And there's no policy justification for the distinction. Our thought is that it was simply a, an error that word was put in there. And the statute, um, the change would, uh, would strike the word knowingly and therefore reconciling the three levels, misdemeanor, gross misdemeanor, and felony. So that's the first of the four changes. Second change is in sections two and six. Um, as Representative Paymar said, this has to do with just updating regarding um, modern means of communication. There were past updates in past sessions to the laws regarding stalking and violation of harassment restraining orders providing for venue with respect to calls and texts and electronic communications. And the bill simply has the same update with regard to orders for protection and um, violations of domestic abuse no contact orders. I point the committee's attention to bill lines 6.1 to 6.5, which happen to contain the current law regarding harassment restraining orders. That law again was um, put into place, I think just last year. And so the committee will note that lines 6.1 through 6.5, having to do with harassment restraining orders, are the same language as in bill sections 2 and 6 with regard to these additional protective orders. So again, simply making a, a fix and a cleanup regarding those. Third change is in bill section 3. Um, again, there's the structure, as I said, misdemeanor, gross misdemeanor, felony level, depending on the, the number of prior, what's called the qualified domestic violence related offenses or QDROs. Well, 
with regard to almost all domestic offenses, it doesn't matter who the victim of that QDVRO was. As long as it was an assault or it was some kind of protective order that the defendant violated, it qualifies and can be used to enhance a later offense. The only exception is gross misdemeanor domestic assault. For some reason, there was language put in there with that statute that, that requires that the QDVRO have been against a domestic victim, a family or household member. Again, there's no policy justification for that, and that's, it's different in that statute as against all the other ones, different than felony domestic assault, for example. So again, the bill would strike that phrase and reconcile gross misdemeanor domestic assault with all the other domestic offenses. The fourth change is in Section 7, and this has to do with the statute that allows um, uh, other domestic conduct to be introduced, evidence of other domestic conduct to be introduced in uh, domestic prosecutions. Um, for a long time, it was thought by uh, the courts, or courts would admit evidence of this domestic conduct in any kind of domestic case, including violations of protective orders. But last year, in uh, the State v. Sparkman case, the court pointed out that under the statute, um, that kind of evidence could only get in when domestic abuse had occurred in the current case. The current case had to do with domestic abuse, and the violation of, of a protective order would not be domestic abuse. And so this uh, change um, simply makes it clear the statute can be used with respect to violations of protective orders. Violation doesn't have to be physically violent and provides that the evidence that can be introduced or the, the kind of evidence that can be introduced will match the kind of case when that evidence can be introduced. In either case, it's domestic conduct. Um, I know that that's a lot, but um, I think it boils down to four fairly technical as opposed to substantive changes. Thank you, Mr. Pinter. Before we go to Ms. Richards, Representative Simon has a question. Representative Simon. I do. Uh, thanks. Uh, Mr. This is for Mr. Pinto, I think, or, or for the bill author. Um, changes two, three, and four I have no problem with and probably will have no problem with number one, and I'm a reliable hardliner on this stuff, except for um, uh, if we get rid of the word knowingly, I'm always a little bit nervous when we don't have a state of mind stated and we just have kind of a what appears to be a strict liability kind of standard. If we get rid of that, is there some other substantive provision elsewhere that would, uh, you know, not in this bill, that would um, impose some sort of state of mind requirement on a violation, or is it just literally for any reason? I mean, if, if for example, part of a, an order for protection is that someone not be within a certain number of feet of someone else and they just purely through accident and inadvertence find themselves at a you know sporting event or at the state fair or something like that, I, I just want to make sure that there's some state of mind requirement, not just literally any violation. Mr. Pinto. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Simon. Um, there are actually two uh, mental states that still will be in place even striking knowingly okay. in the sense that first the state will have to prove as with any violation of protective order that the defendant knew of the existence of the order so that's that's an element regardless and then uh, this crime so any crime when an intent uh, element is not or intent is not specified in the text it's a general intent crime and so the state is still required to prove general intent, but it's not a strict liability crime, and, and the courts are pretty limited in, in what can be a strict liability crime. That was my only question. That, thank I, you. Thanks. Mr. Pinto, my question related to that, too. Did the Court of Appeals or Supreme Court, whichever court cases you're dealing with, construe the current statutory scheme as a specific intent crime because of, of knowingly in there? I'm not following their interpretation of the law. What, what made it problematic? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. The, the case that I was citing was State v. Gunderson, uh, 812 Northwest 2nd, 156. And the court uh, said to quote, the question then is whether the gross misdemeanor slash felony term knowingly violates requires more than proof that an, that an individual knew of the existence of the order and in fact violated that order. Of course, a misdemeanor violation would simply require the person knew of the order and in fact violated it. And the court answered that question, yes. Because of the term knowingly, uh, the state was required to prove more than simply the individual knew of the order and violated the order. And it's that that the bill change is attempting to deal with. So it's simply the knowing of the order and violating it just as in a misdemeanor violation. I think I understand. So any prosecutor is prosecuting this case and district court uh, simply had to prove, prove knowledge of the existence of the order and it was their intent to prove uh, a general intent to violate it. 
and the court said, well, you needed to prove something else there that you didn't put into evidence, therefore, boom, overturned. Is that right? It is, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, yes, that's true. Um, and in fact, the challenge in the Gunderson case and, and another subsequent case was that um, the jury instruction, this is so seemingly so straightforward that the jury instructions actually did not include that word knowingly because the committee of, of attorneys who drafted them thought simply the same elements applied, know of the existence of the order and violated it. And, and the, the court con, uh, flipped those convictions in part because that instruction hadn't been there, but in the course of saying that had pointed out that there would be this additional element required, essentially getting into the subjective intent. Um, so making this into a specific intent crime, though they didn't use that term. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Richards. Uh, uh, Chair and committee, I'm not actually here to testify. I was here to sit if there were any questions. We are um, coming here in support of the bill um, with the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. Thank you very much, Ms. Richards. Questions from members of the committee? Representative Johnson. Mr. Chair, uh, you I, I have the same concern that you did with the word knowingly being taken out along with Representative Simon. Um, my question is how, how would it work with, uh, I don't know if any, everybody else knows about short orders. I've served many of them. Uh, we don't. When we do a short order, we do not list all the all the elements of the order. We just notify the person of the order and give them a copy of the basic order. And if a violation occurs before they actually get their order, they wouldn't know, knowingly know what's in that order. By taking this out, they'd be they could be charged on that order even though they don't know what's in it at that time. Correct, Mr. Pinto, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Johnson. Um, so the again proving a violation would would be the same whether it's a misdemeanor gross misdemeanor or felony so the state would be required to prove that the defendant knew of the order and had in fact violated the order um, this again um, in the case that you describe if the defendant were charged with a misdemeanor this obviously doesn't change that at all we have to prove those things and the fact the defendant ha happens to have a prior conviction within the past 10 years or two priors so we're in gross misdemeanor or felony land shouldn't change the requirement to prove that so yes the state would have to show the defendant knew of the order and if say the short form used to serve the defendant didn't include the extra information then I think that element would be very difficult for the state to prove at that point point. and again that has nothing to do with this additional word knowingly if I can help by explanation, uh, Representative Johnson, there, there are two elements. There's the knowledge of the order, which is the knowingly, but then the court construed that there's a second part that required knowingly, and that be that you knowingly violated it. And removal of that word knowingly would in no way remove the knowing element, knowing word from the first element. They still do have to show it, and that was the concern Representative Simon raised and has been adequately addressed for my purposes anyway. Representative Cornish. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Pamar and I uh, both uh, carry bills like this before and uh, big advocates for this organization, but it still, still uh, bothers me if the, all prosecutors will interpret and enforce this the same and cops, and it's a huge stretch just on the face when you strike knowingly out of because we got so many laws that say with intent or knowingly or um, but uh, it's just I guess I got the same concern and if it doesn't make any difference why are we taking it out there's still unknowingly there uh, just bothers me somewhat I understand uh, Mr. Pinto uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Cornish um, Again, the, the misdemeanor version of this has this requirement of knowing the violation, of knowing that the order exists. Um, I mean, the, the, if you imagine inserting that word knowingly into the misdemeanor version, it would be that the person who, who knows of the existence and then knowingly violates. And that obviously it's sort of this double, and that's essentially what's going on with the gross misdemeanor and felony versions of the statute, um, as, it's, as it's adding an additional element. Um, in the, in the, and so the... Uh, again, for the consistency at each stage, there's still the requirement that the state prove that, uh, a certain mental state, um, but this requires this additional level, as I say, has been a, has been a challenge um, in these appellate cases. Hey, Mr. Pinto. Oh, Representative Cornish, go ahead. Just as a follow-up, I th th think it would be a good idea in the future if we have bills like this, me included, to run it by the prosecutors when you have something like this and have them come to the table, have them have time to study it and reassure us and take a formal position on it would make me feel more comfortable, yeah. but I'll probably still vote for the bill anyway, but it would be. Reps and Paymar. 
Thanks, Chair. Because Mr. Pinto explain what the process that this bill's gone through, or, or, or Mr. Richard. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Cornish. So the bill has been endorsed by the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. So I'm here. I'm here testifying on behalf. It went through both the Criminal Law Committee, oh. and then also through the board of the County Attorneys Association. You said so, that earlier in your yeah, my, I uh, it. Sorry. Yeah. Am I correct? Um, in would would I be correct in stating, Mr. Pinto, uh, that that the second knowingly, which people are focused on, is, is kind of extraneous, like a sixth toe or something. What would a prosecutor look at that and say, wouldn't they, wouldn't they just dismiss that and say knowingly what? I mean, it's, if it's not a specific intent crime, there, there would be no point to even considering that word knowingly in the second part. Am I correct? Um, Mr. Chair, I guess I'll point out that the members of the uh, jury instruction committee who are, you know, quite experienced attorneys when they put together the criminal jury instructions for this crime, um, as well as the attorneys working on the several cases that got flipped on appeal, they saw that word knowingly and just thought that it was the same as knowing of the existence of the order. Um, the court carefully parsing the language of the statute said, well, no, the word has a particular, has this additional meaning and added on this additional um, uh, gloss on top of it. But to point out, there were a number of experienced attorneys who, who did in fact, yes, I think that's right, Mr. Chair, who did believe it was superfluous. We now have the courts looking at it and saying, well, no, actually it adds this additional requirement. But again, it's a requirement that, that, uh, that we believe was probably not intended when these statutes were, were enacted, to have an additional level of looking into the subjective intent of the of the defendant in ways that we, we don't in other crimes. Mr. Pinto, did the court suggest of what kind of specific intent yeah. knowingly would construe, or did they just leave that blank? Uh, Mr. Chair, well, what they what they said in um, uh, was implication again that the state would be required to prove the defendant's subjective understanding of the language of the order and and what was in the defendant's mind. I'm not sure if there was more than that Thanks. in the in the Gunderson case. Thank you, Representative Simon. So. Uh, Mr. Pinto, and, and in terms of Representative Cornish's question, I know that you are a prosecutor and you do this stuff for a living. Um, so back to my original hy hypothetical, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Um, let's say there's an order uh, in place that a uh, perpetrator is not to be within, you know, 500 feet of victim. They run into each other at the state fair, you know, Sweet Martha's Cookies or something like that. They each went on their uh, a trip there completely separately, and the perpetrator knows of the order, knows that he's under an obligation not to appear within 500 feet of the victim, totally understands that, knows it every day. Uh, but suddenly there he is at the state fair, victim sees him, calls someone. What result? Mr. Pinto. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Simon. Um, I, I think uh, I'll compare your hypothetical to a situation where, you know, if the defendant is, is, let's say, is unconscious and is brought to be next to a victim, well, clearly there's not the general intent at that point. There needs to be the sufficient, um, uh, you know, consciousness and awareness of what's going on to be, to be prosecuted. So there, too, if the defendant turns around and the victim is there at that moment, the defendant doesn't have the general intent to do something. Now, if the defendant does not turn around and leave at that point, well then, there's the consciousness of what's going on, and then, in fact, the, the person can be prosecuted. Um, and that's why this, is this, like others, is a general intent crime. There is a necessity, it's not strict liability, there is a necessity of, of awareness and consciousness, but it's not that next level up of needing to get into the defendant's, defendant's mind about precisely how that person was interpreting the order and proving that they were thinking of it and, and were aware of their own violation in a particular way. Mr. Gibson Simon. Questions from members? What are we doing? Passing the general register. Okay, there being no other questions, then um, Representative Paymar renews his motion that House File 1400, as amended, be recommended to pass and referred to the general register. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion passes. Thank you, members. No, no, nothing else. Are we adjourning or recessing? Okay, there being no other business before the committee, uh, committee's adjourned.